Peony and Angelica notice their young master, Bai Shouan, shaking while standing inside the hospital. Seeing him like that for the first time, the twin starts worrying for him. Peony did not hesitate to approach and ask her young master if he was okay. As expected from Bai Shouan, he tells her that he's okay and totally fine. Well, we should be tougher during tough times. Not long after, they reach a special intensive care unit made for VIPs like his grandpa. He then starts to wonder why Angelica and Peony won't say a word all the way that room. Before entering the slightly open door, Bai Shouan asked the twin what had happened to his grandpa, but none of the two answered. Then, a familiar voice from the room called his name. It turns out that it was his mom, along with his uncle Yuan Xiaocheng. She was about to tell him something about his grandpa's condition, but knowing it would break Bai Shouan's heart, she did not continue it. Hmm, it seems like Gramps is not in good condition. I did not so far distance Mr. Fung and their family butler, Alfred, stand near the bed where Lord Bai rests. Seeing his favorite grandchild, Lord Bai felt happy. He then used all of his strength to sit upright and removed his oxygen mask to acknowledge the presence of his grandchild. Soon after, he orders everyone to leave the two of them alone, for he has something important to say to him. As people leave the room, Lord Bai asks his grandson if he did not get hurt. Well, Gramps, you better worry about yourself first, just look at how many bandages you have wrapped around your body. Bai Shouan assures his grandpa that he is completely fine. Then, he could no longer hide his worry about his grandpa, and he looked at him with eyes filled with sympathy. Lord Bai shows his broken arm to his grandson and tells him that what happened to him was not a big deal, except for his right arm. Apparently, he could no longer move it like he used to. Then, he says that what he is about to tell him is much more serious. Ah, oh, oh, it looks like trouble is starting to get double. That being said, Bai Shouan felt a little scared, for that was the first time that he had ever seen his grandpa so nervous as a diamond class beast master. Lord Bai then asks him if he has heard about the devil spider cult before. Hearing this, Bai Shouan tells his grandpa that all he knows about them is that they are a terrorist group, which Lord Bai confirms. Well, it seemed like they are the Team Rocket wannabes in this series. However, Lord Bai revealed that until the recent event, their members' strength had been limited to silver level beast masters. However, after fighting them, Lord Bai figured out that judging from their auras in the recent incident, they were all diamond level beast masters. He even added that it was very evident that Bolin City was more targeted than the previous attacks, and their plans were getting ahead of them. As they commonly say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and enemies are no exception. All of a sudden, a strong wind enters the window, and Bai Shouan asks his grandpa if the earthquake was part of the Devil's Spider Cult's plan. Lord Bai puts back his oxygen mask and denies it. Then, he tells him that it is a much more serious situation. Sensing that Lord Bai is greatly troubled, the Eye of Apocalypse reveals to Bai Shouan that his grandpa thinks that the world is about to be destroyed. It also reveals that, unlike him, Lord Bai does not know about the merging with the other realm. That being said, Bai Shouan ensures his grandpa that nothing bad will happen, for his intuition tells him that the Zhu Chao world, or the secret world of the spider's nest, will not be destroyed. He further explains to Lord Bai that it is just merging with another realm. Hmm, shall we call it Realm Fusion? Puzzled by his revelation, Lord Bai asks him if he is sure of what he is saying. Bai Shouan immediately confirms this, and he reassures his grandpa that what he told him is what he personally foresaw. He further explains that the two worlds are merging, so that's why there was an earthquake. Upon hearing what Bai Shouan said, Lord Bai felt relieved. Soon after, Lord Bai opened up to his grandson about him coming from the Bai family of the Origin Star. This shocks and confuses Bai Shouan. For the Origin Star is a concept that is not known to him. That being said, Lord Bai tells him his backstory. When Lord Bai was still in the Origin Star, he was the candidate for the head of the Bai family. Whoa, they look like celestial beings. Well, more likely because, as the name suggests, Origin Star. However, at that time, he was arrogant and conceited, which might cause him trouble in the future. Later on, he makes a mistake, and he is expelled from the Bai family by an unknown being dressed in a weird suit. Moments later, he was exiled to the secret world of the spider's nest. Here, Lord Bai is seen along with his beast pet, Red-Eyed Golden Fish. The origin star is not that hard on him. In fact, they gave him a second chance, but it came with one condition. Once he kills the Amethyst Spirit Beast, or what is commonly known as the Spider Mother, 
it will be able to return to the origin star. Sheesh. That looks like a floor boss in Damachi. However, Lord Bai was too anxious back then, and he underestimated the strength of the Amethyst-level beast. That being said, the red-eyed golden fish was badly defeated, and its origin was damaged, causing its inability to evolve. Poor beast pet, it looks like his inner core got punctured by a purple laser. Then back to the present time, he tells Bai Shouan with a heavy heart that his domineering majestic beast pet, Phoenix Crown Cloud Winged Crane, is dead. With too much disappointment running inside his clouded mind, Ward Bai closes his eyes and tells Bai Shouan that there's currently no hope of beating the Amethyst level beast. Bai Shouan puts his right arm on Lord Bai's shoulder and tells him that he must still have a chance. Lord Bai then sighs heavily and tells Bai Shouan that he does not understand. He puts his left hand on the shoulder of Bai Shouan and explains to him that he is the future of the Bai family. Moreover, Lord Bai reminds Bai Shouan about his ambition to become the strongest beast master. Thus, Bai Shouan looks at his grandpa with so much conviction. Lord Bai then told him to go to the Origin Star. To do that, Bai Shouan needs to participate in the secret selection after one year. He further explains that if he gets into the top 10 rankings, he will be able to return to the Origin Star. Lord Bai emphasizes to him that only with the help of the Origin Star he will have the opportunity to become the strongest beast master. Hmm. What is that origin star? Is it like the hyperbolic time chamber that Goku uses as a training ground? Well, that's something that we should look forward to. After hearing that, Bai Shouan helps his grandpa, who is shaking with so much pain, to go back to his comfortable position. Lord Bai then removes his necklace that holds the key to the Bai Family Resources Treasury Vault. He tells Bai Shouan that he is fully aware that he is talented and high-spirited. That being said, Lord Bai believes that the resources of the Bai family will be enough to support him with his growth. Lord Bai also tells him that the resources that might be vital for his fast growth are found inside the treasury. Moreover, he revealed that the resources available to him to use are already enough to advance him to the diamond level. Nonetheless, when Bai Shouan is about to get it from Lord Bai, he tells his grandson not to be like him when he is younger, and he wants him to keep in his mind that the most important thing in the world is the human bond. Bai Shouan got so shocked after hearing that as his grandpa reminded him of his captain in his past life. Well, we cannot deny that there is a higher possibility that Lord Bai is his captain's reincarnation in that world. In the first place, nothing is impossible with Isikai. After hearing those exact same words from his past life, he agreed to what his grandpa told him and accepted the key wholeheartedly. While the day is still young, and a bright blue sky and brightly shining sun are still in its glorious hour, Little Bai Ziyu is sadly waiting for her brother's return. She asks two of their family maids if his brother is also sick like his grandpa because she wonders why she is not home yet. One of the two maids tells her to calm down, while the other one assures her that his brother, Bai Shouan, will be fine. Soon after, Bai Ziyu felt his brother's arrival. What a cute little munchkin. She's definitely giving me the vibes of Anya from the Spy X family. While the words of his grandpa and his former captain linger in his mind, he seriously looks at the key to the Bai Family Resources Treasury Vault. Meanwhile, a rushing little Bai Ziyu welcomes him to their home. All of a sudden, Bai Shouan felt the presence of his sister, which he compares to a cat, ready to smooch his face. And just like that, the two maids and the twins got weirded out of Bai Ziyu's action. When Bai Shouan wraps him with his hands, his little sister tells him how relieved she is that he is finally back. Then, she immediately asks her brother if she is all right. Hearing that his little sister genuinely cares for her, Bai Shouan feels so delighted, while patting her little sister's head. Bai Shouan tells her that he is completely fine. At that very moment, Bai Shouan starts to realize that he has such a lovely family in that world, and he should cherish it wholeheartedly. Well, I couldn't agree more. Bro, you better value and protect your loving family at all costs. Having experienced death in his previous life, Bai Shouan has always been afraid of being weak and powerless. This is the main reason why he wants to become the strongest beast master in the world where he currently lives. That being said, he finally realized the most important thing ever, which is the family bond. Then, an image of his whole family flashes in his mind, with his beloved grandpa pulling him out of the darkness. Later that day, Pai Shouan enters a room where the box containing the gold-level spiritual beast egg of the purple thunder eagle is. Apparently, he doesn't want to waste any more time. So he puts on his new attire to get ready for his adventure. Well, he definitely has a good sense of fashion. As expected from the always curious Bai Ziyu, 
She wonders what is inside the box while hiding behind his brother and trying to get a sneak peek. Noticing that she is around, Pai Shouwen asks her a simple favor, which is to give the box to their mom and dad as soon as they come back home. Then, as expected, Bai Ziyu happily accepts whatever her brother asks her to do. When he's about to leave, Pai Shouwen explains to Bai Ziyu that he has very important matters to attend to and he needs to go out for a while. That being said, he reminds his little sister always to behave and to listen well at home until their mom and dad come back. Well, this is one of the few moments where Ba Shouwen acts so cute. Little does he know, Chao Gubei is there watching them from a not so far distance. When he moves closer, Ba Shouwen notices her. Chao Gubei, being herself, instantly blushes the moment Ba Shouwen looks at her. Not to mention, her beautifully proportional body matches well with her body fit attire. Well, not gonna lie, the longer you see her, the more beautiful she becomes. Bai Shouwen asks Xiao Gubai if she is ready to accompany him on a risky adventure, to which she agrees. She even told him, while blushing, that wherever her young master goes, she will go. Then, the two of them walk together. Along the way, Bai Shouwen asks Xiao Gubai if she is not scared. Xiao Gubai tells him that with her young master around, she won't be afraid. Moreover, Pai Shouwen asks her if she can possibly stop calling him young master. Chao Gubei immediately responded and calls him Master Shouwen instead. The chemistry between the two is very evident. I am definitely shipping them. Moments later, in the middle of the ruined city of Bolin, the impact of the disaster is highly evident. Bai Shouwen and Chao Gubei are in the scene middle of the highway. Chao Gubei asks him if he has decided where they are going. Bai Shouwen tells her that he has not figured out where the location is yet. At the back of his mind, Bai Shouwen thinks that he is going out that time to improve his skills and also to collect some materials along the way. That being said, he tells Xiao Gubei that he has to investigate some information first before deciding the route they will go. It feels like someone bro is starting to mature. Meanwhile, the Eye of Apocalypse is lurking above him as he asks it how to heal his grandpa's broken arm. As expected from our all-knowing giant eye, he gave the exact information needed. Apparently, Bai Shouan needs the water of life to heal his grandpa's broken arm. It looks like typical water filled with the nutrients of the red, green, yellow, and blue mystical herbs. After that, Bai Shouan asks another question on how to heal his grandpa's beast pet or the red-eyed golden fish. The Eye of Apocalypse revealed to him that since the essence of the red-eyed golden fish, the treasured beast of Lord Bai, has been damaged, it needs the spiritual water to be nourished. The exact item that he needs to find is the spiritual water of Chan Shi Wei. It is an amethyst level material that contains an amazing source of water element. Moreover, it is of great benefit to spiritual beasts of the water element. Basically, the spiritual water of Chan Shi Wei is a bundle of blue crystals that forms a circular shape with mystic floating water inside it. When Bai Shouan tries to find the location of the items, the water of life and the spiritual water of Chan Shi Wei, with the system, he is surprised to see very few results for the water of life and no result for the spiritual water of Chan Shi Wei. Oh, it looks like this is an impossible mission. This is kind of stressful for Bai Shouan as there are little to no information on how to find the item that will fix Lord Bai's broken arm. What's even worse is that there is completely no record of how to find the item that will heal the red-eyed golden fish. Bai Shouan decided to set aside the problem and ask the Eye of Apocalypse, how could the core of the Awakening Hall be repaired? Little did he know, it would only give him additional stress as there is currently no way how to fix the core of the Awakening Hall. Moreover, it was manufactured by the Awakening Temple of the Origin Star, so the beings from the said temple are the ones who know how to fix it. Apparently, after that unfortunate battle, Bai Shouan thinks that his grandpa lost a lot, so he leaves behind the Egg of the Purple Thunder Eagle and the evolutionary path of the Amethyst level. To him, this is just to give Lord Bai a little hope. But he cannot deny the fact that the true hope that can save Bolin City is still on the Origin Star. Despite how impossible the task may seem, Bai Shouan still tries to figure out what he should do that very moment. Even if the system tells him that there is no record of the spiritual water of Chan Shi Wei, he still looks for the possible places where he can go to find it. Salute to your dedication, bro. Seeing him very dedicated to fulfilling his task, the Eye of Apocalypse helps Bai Shouan to the best of its ability. Apparently, he is not just a mere huge eye, he also has a hand. Well, shall we call it the Hand of the Apocalypse? This, 
however, has a side effect on Bai Shouan's body. Technically, when the Eye of Apocalypse uses its hand, Bai Shouan cannot even move a muscle of his body. This, of course, instantly shocks Bai Shouan. However, he did not freak out even if he saw a huge hand over his shoulder as he knew it was the Eye of the Apocalypse. Basically, the Eye of the Apocalypse points out the place on the map where Bai Shouan should go. Well, Bro definitely obtained the greatest chi to all time in the secret world of the spider's nest. Meanwhile, Chao Gubai asks Bai Shouan if he has found anything useful about their adventure. Although, at that time, Bai Shouan still cannot move from the side effect of the mysterious hand of the Eye of the Apocalypse. Where the side effect subsides, Bai Shouan tells her they have to leave the city first, and the East Gate is open. That being said, Bai Shouan plans to exit the city from that location. Chao Gubai, on the other hand, asks him if they have to cross the wasteland, for he has a very bad feeling about the area. Bai Shouan then laughs at her and reminds her that they are both beast masters, so there's nothing to be afraid of. Moreover, he told her that they could also join the adventure group and hitch a ride. While they continue to walk, Chao Gubai asks Bai Shouan about the adventure group. She basically wonders about who they are. Bai Shouan then tells her that they are just a few mercenaries going out of the city to explore the wilderness and something like that. While the sky is still in broad daylight, the East Gate is bombarded with extreme vehicle traffic and a lot of people gather to exit Bolin City. The gate monitors are stressed out as they gently remind everyone to accept the inspection and leave the city in an orderly manner. Seeing this huge crowd, Bai Shouan could not believe his eyes. Well, bro, you could have anticipated this after the big disaster in your city. Standing behind the huge crowd, Bai Shouan tells Chao Gu Bai that her gut feeling is right. Not long after, a huge armed truck charges quickly in their direction. Bai Shouan then tells Chao Gu Bai to be careful. Nonetheless, as being unlucky with the situation chases her down, Chao Gu Bai gets almost hit by the armed vehicle. Fortunately, Bai Shouan is there as his knight in shining armor, who was always ready to save the day. When the armed vehicle went through, they were shocked, and both of them stayed in their position. Realizing that they hold hands tightly in the situation, the two of them blush, and they both feel the butterflies in their stomach. Whoops! Shall we make a Sia Pai fan club? To break the awkwardness, the two quickly turn back from each other. Bai Shouan asks her if she's okay, which Chao Gu Bai immediately confirms. Soon after, Chao Gu Bai asks Bai Shouan why there are so many people already leaving the city, considering that the Beast Tide has just started recently. Bai Shouan then tells her they are mostly wealthy people who think that Bolin City is finished and want to take the opportunity to escape. He even added that because they cannot survive in the wilderness, they tend to hire an adventure group to protect themselves. Bai Shouan further explains that if a rich man hires an adventure group, naturally, there will be more rich people who will hire other adventure groups. Well, rich people use their money in all possible ways. Money, indeed, runs the world. After quite some time, the East Gate got finally opened. The gate monitors warned them to beware of the vicious beast attacks. They even reminded them to check the vehicles leaving the city carefully to ensure the military lanes are not obstructed. Bai Shouan and Chao Gu Bai listened to what they further explain. Apparently, all the personnel leaving the city are requested to unload their weapons and equipment, show their identification, and comply with the inspections. Bai Shouan thinks that right after the disaster and the terrible attack, his father did not close the city for the investigation, which was meant to give the community a false sense of security. Well, when you are a leader and your people panic, the first thing you need to do is calm them down. After the identification check of Bai Shouan and Chao Gu Bai, they are allowed to enter the tunnel that leads to the city exit. Before leaving the city, people are advised to wear their protective masks. That being said, Bai Shouan and Chao Gu Bai wear cool-looking masks. Sheesh. These masks resemble Kaneki's mask in Tokyo Ghoul. Behold, the hot and dry wasteland. Just merely looking at this area, I can feel the uncomfortable heat. In this area, Chao Gu Bai and Bai Shouwa need to deal with the harsh environment, where there is a constant flow of strong winds and thick dust. Bai Shouwa observes the area, and it seems that the line of defense has buried countless beasts in the area. At that moment, he thinks that they should first find the adventure group's lookout station. Meanwhile, Chao Gu Bai starts to feel the extreme heat in the area. Using his binocular-like gadget, he immediately finds the lookout station of the adventure group. 
Ba Shouan immediately tells Chao Gubai that he found the adventure group's lookout station and they should go there as soon as possible. A few hours before sunset, while the sky is still bright, Ba Shouan and Chao Gubai reach the lookout station. Here, they see several adventurers who are busy doing their tasks. Some are collecting chopped wood, while some are welding metals. They even pass by some seductive and thick adventurers that are gonna take you to a different kind of adventure. Soon after, they reach a huge tent with a flag on top. Pai Shouan believes that the group they are looking for is in that area. Seemingly, the huge tent belongs to the Red Ape Mercenary. Their flag displays an image of an ape with burning red body fur. Little did Bai Shouan and Chao Gu Bai know two members of the Red Ape Mercenary were observing them. Feng Lang, the muscular, blonde-haired sniper wearing a see-through top, tells his comrade Lao Duan to check out the two newcomers at their front door. He then asks what he thinks about them. Lo Duan, the extremely buff tattooed guy with orange hair, said that the two look well crafted. Lo Duan immediately calls their attention. And just like that, they immediately approach the two newcomers. Lo Duan asks them if they are lost. Sheesh. I thought she would ask Chao Gubai the iconic question. Are you lost, baby girl? Meanwhile, Feng Lang appears from behind while whistling. Chao Gubai then tells Bai Shawan that they don't look like good people at all. Well, we should not judge a book by its cover, but I won't disagree with her gut feeling. As the two feel like being cornered, Bai Shouan starts thinking that after Chao Gu Bai arrives at the Bai family's house, he doesn't really know what switch turned for her. He, however, is quite sure that she always attracts other people's attention. Well, poor Chao Gu Bai. Just look at how scared she is. Seeing her feel extremely uncomfortable, Pai Shouan releases his water system, ready to attack the two. However, Lao Duvin quickly goes in between the two, saying that the area outside the city is very dangerous, so they should let him protect them. While everyone expects him to make an advanced move toward Chao Gubei, is actually the complete opposite. He wraps his huge muscular arms around Bai Shouan and calls him Bud as he plays with his chin. Well, it looks like Bro attracted him very well. This, of course, shocks him, and he cannot believe the fact that he is actually talking to him. Apparently, Chao Gubei got extremely weirded out by what she was witnessing. The facial expression says it all. Lo Duvin did not stop from that, and he even teased Bai Shouan, who is currently containing extreme anger. Not to mention, he calls him little baby. Oops. It looks like bro will explode anytime soon. I can definitely feel the tension with his hand. Boom. Pai Shouan smacks him down the floors in a complete 360. Sheesh. That surely is painful. The way have his head hit the floor already implies a head injury. Not to mention, he even bends his hand in a way where he cannot fight back. However, it looks like Lao Duvin's head is as hard as Tanjiro's to the point that he survived that impact. Not long after, Lao Duvin calls Fun Lang for help, and from Little Baby, he instantly changes what he calls him into Crazy Boy. The completely pissed off Bai Shouan exudes extreme bloodlust and releases a strong water system aura around his body. He then gave Lao Duan a very cold stare and asked him if he wanted to give it a try. Feng Lang got stunned when he felt a heavy murderer's aura from Bai Shouan. Soon after the confrontation, an announcement was made, which caught all their attention. Another member of the Red Ape Mercenary, named Sasha, appears and asks the deputy leader what is going on, for there is too much noise in that place. Meanwhile, the deputy squad leader, named Shi Ming, tells her that the arrival of the fierce beasts probably caused the noise. Moreover, Ji Qing tells them that according to the thermal sensing scan that she conducted, there are probably around two to three hundred beast monsters arriving in the area. Uh oh. It sounds like a disaster to me. Qi Ming asks Feng Lang how the situation is going. Feng Lang asks him if he is done doing his stuff and tells him that the situation is not good based on what he can see. It turns out that a herd of rampaging beast monsters is on the way to their location. Upon viewing his telescope, he finds out there are fierce beasts in the east arriving at the outpost within five minutes. Meanwhile, Lo Du and tells Bai Shouan that he should let him go, for they are on the same rope at that very moment. He also tells Bai Shouan that he doesn't want them to fight when the fierce beasts are on their way to the location. On the other hand, Bai Shouan just looked down on him without saying anything. After that, Bai Shouan lets him go and tells him to stay away from him. Meanwhile, Xiao Gu Bai is just there beside Bai Shouan, waiting for him to finish his business. As they move outside, Several members of the Red Ape mercenary move back inside the lookout station. 
Lobduvin tells them to hurry up and tell their deputy squad leader that it is getting extremely chaotic outside. Uh, oh. Trouble alert. That being said, a flaming man appears on the top of the wall telling everyone not to panic. It turns out that it is the deputy squad leader of the Red Ape mercenary, Chi Ming. Is it just me? Or is he really giving the vibes of Zora IDL from Black Clover? His hair, though, might be comparable to those of the Silva. Chi Ming explains to everyone that it is too late for them to run back to the city at that point. He further explains that only by resisting together and waiting for the rescued, they have a chance to survive. Bai Shuan is quite relieved that at least there are people who understand the situation. He then announces to everyone that he is Chi Ming, a silver-level beast master of the Red Ape mercenary squad. He even tells them that he will take care of the frontal battle, but they still need a beast master to guard the other side. After that, he asks the crowd who among them is willing to join the plan. Bai Shouan sees that there are quite a number of beast masters from the crowd. Unfortunately, the capable ones are not willing to join any mercenary squad. When Bai Shouan is about to volunteer, a sudden, a voice from the crowd is heard, claiming that he is also a silver-level beast tamer. Whoops, it looks like someone's spotlight got stolen. Upon seeing who volunteered, Pai Shouan gets shocked and starts to wonder if he is even aware of what kind of situation he is currently in. It turns out that the one who volunteered was Ming Xiao, a rich young guy wearing eyeglasses and expensive clothes. He is the young master of the Ming family. He then asks Qi Ming to give him some firepower, and he guarantees everyone that he will hold them off. It's the confidence for me. Bro. Meanwhile, Qi Ming thinks that he's just a stupid rich guy and wonders if he is really up for it. That being said, he asks Lo Duwen and Feng Lang to take some people from mercenary teams and go to the other side with heavy weapons, to which the two immediately complies. Well, boosting the morale of the team is one of the leader's obligations. Then when the team for both sides got assembled, Qi Ming shouted at them to stay alive, which they all shouted back together. Meanwhile, Bai Shouan asks Cheo Gu Bai to stay behind him and be ready to protect herself, for the man who acts as their main leader is totally incompetent. Hmm. Give him a chance. Bro. Maybe he can really pull it off. Besides, when no one wanted to volunteer, he bravely did it. Nonetheless, Chao Gubai agrees with what he said. Meanwhile, the scary silence starts to linger in the lookout station. This is the part of any story where at any moment, monsters will attack or something bad will happen. That being said, Chi Ming starts summoning his beast pet. Moments later, everyone starts to work to secure their place from the herd of monsters approaching the area. Here a mysterious man starts praying. He prays for their mighty lord to be with them all and grant them the wisdom to win and the courage to endure all the troubles that they are about to face. Hmm, is that an awakening stone? Well, it pretty much looks like one. It turns out that this man is a young priest who reads their holy scripture. In his prayer, he prays for the mighty lord's blessings to be with him and all of his brothers and sisters in the area. Moreover, he said in his prayer that they would all humbly accept their mighty lord's word. At that moment, everyone hears his prayer. He continues reading the holy scripture, saying that their mighty lord's words have the power to save them from the sin of arrogance and to gain courage and humility with their mighty lord's blessings. Then, he ended the prayer by asking their mighty god to keep them safe from discouragement, sorrow, and weakness. Well, bro's prayer definitely hits the nerve of each one of them. Not long after, Lo Dun approaches and asks Bai Shouan if he is also a beast master. He even tells him that judging for how skillful he handles things, he must be quite powerful. Not to mention, he tells Bai Shouan that he thinks he is way better than Ming Xiao. Well, you are talking to the MC. So what else do you expect, bro? Nonetheless, Bai Shouan being himself, tells Lo Duan immediately that he seems not only a typical muscled guy, for his brain is also filled with muscles. Sheesh. Bro is low-key proud of himself. Hearing what he said, Lo Duan tells him that his mouth is quite sharp. Moreover, he also tells him that his little girlfriend looks very scared. That being said, Chao Gubai is indeed very scared, and he is currently shaking while holding her dagger. When Bai Shouan touches his shoulder and asks her if she's okay, she instantly gets shocked, and her body trembles. With a very scared look, she assures him that she is fine. She is just a little nervous. That doesn't seem a little nervous to me. Sis. Nonetheless, Bai Shouan tells her that when the fierce beast rushes in later, she must keep a close distance from him. And everything will be alright. 
Bai Shouan and Chao Gu Bai stand behind large metal containers while waiting for the signal to fight. Not long after, Lao Duan starts shouting at everyone to be ready to fight, for the beasts are coming soon. Sheesh, that is one huge firepower. Soon, the herd of monsters rushes to the lookout station. They look like tough canine units with a purple hair-like structure in their triangular head. Definitely, not your typical beast pet. Well, they seem like mutated monsters. On the other hand, Fong Lang is on the lookout tower and tells everyone not to fire yet, for the monsters are about to enter the minefield. Then just like that, a huge explosion happened, killing several monsters in the process. Lao Duan can't help but admire the minefield created by his amazing comrade, Ji Qing. However, the number of monsters who survived the minefield can still easily outnumber them. Fun Lang looks at his scope and says that the beasts are pretty tenacious while targeting the head of the monster. Then, he shoots powerful ammo from his very long sniper rifle, blowing off the head of the monster. What a strong bullet you got there, bro. Then, he continues to shoot the head of the monsters one by one. Despite magnificently killing the monsters, he immediately calls the attention of Lao Duan as some of the monsters pass through him and start to rush to his comrade's place. Meanwhile, there are some automatic machine guns over the walls to shoot the other monsters. However, some monsters still manage to slip away from Ji Qing's automatic machine guns. This, however, infuriates Ji Qing. She then asks Lao Duan why didn't he go after the monster after seeing it. Well, Sis definitely has a point. Lo Duan, on the other hand, told her that her mechanic gun's caliber was too small, and he didn't like it, for the biggest caliber was simply the best for him. Then, Lo Duan went all out, shooting the monsters aggressively. That being said, monsters are seen falling one by one. However, the monsters are too many, to the point that some still managed to reach and climb the walls of the lookout station. Bai Shouan saw the beasts and alerted everyone that bronze, level beasts were coming their way. That being said, the flashy Ming Xiao says that it's finally his turn to take action from a not so far distance. Bai Shouan looks at him completely pissed off. Well, it looks like bro is pissed off that the spotlight was stolen from him again. On the other hand, Lao Duvan orders them to throw down the gasoline can before it's too late. The other members of the Red Ape mercenary did not waste any time, and they started dropping and throwing the gasoline cans at the monsters. Fung Lang targeted one of the cans causing it to explode. Then all of the cans exploded in the fire, burning several monsters in the process. Seeing how synchronized their move is, Bai Shouan can't help but praise them for being quite something as adventurers. Hearing it, Lao Duan became so proud and told Bai Shouan that the strength of the Red Ape mercenary group could be counted among the best in the entire wasteland. Moments later, as the fire continues to burn the monsters, their alpha arrives is way stronger than the normal monsters but looks quite similar except for its size and hair-like structure, which is turquoise in color. Soon after, all the remaining monsters gather around their alpha. Lao Duvin sees that the main beast is coming their way. Of course, Pai Shouan also notices it. He then uses his Eye of the Apocalypse to check the stats and abilities of the monster. Pai Shouan finds out that it comes from the race of the alchemy ferocious beast with steel system from the high-grade silver realm. It has the Broken Iron, C-Class, Talent, and qualifies as high-grade silver. Moreover, it has three signature skills, Battle Cry and Rust Covering both in Green Grade and Iron Jaw in Blue Grade. That being said, the monster uses its skill, Battle Cry, turning its hair-like structure into red color. Not only that, Battle Cry is a skill that boosts the power of its ally. That being said, all of the remaining purple monsters turn into red color like their alpha, Sheesh. This monster instantly mega-evolves all of its minions. Fung Lang looks at his scope and targets the Alpha. He then informs Lao Duan that they have about 7 or 8 silver-level monsters in the area. This immediately shocks him and asks him if he is being serious. That being said, Lao Duan immediately asks the Ming Xiao to go over a certain area to hold the backline, which he immediately follows and tells Lao Duan to leave it to him. Again, Bai Shouan looks at him, completely annoyed. Well. This is the third time that the spotlight has been stolen from him. Ming Xiao then summons his beast pet, Golden Horned Frog. Whoa, that looks poisonous. As expected, the Eye of the Apocalypse shows that the beast comes from the race of the Golden Horned Frog with gold system from the Intermediate Silver Realm. It has flexible body, B-class, talent and qualifies as advanced gold. Moreover, it has three signature skills, 
Big tongue and metal body both in blue grade and toad bomb in green grade. Well, his monster looks pretty tough if you will compare it to the stats of the alpha of the enemies. Meanwhile, on the other side of the lookout station, Qi Ming, who is currently fighting along with his beast pet, realizes that the silver level ones are giving too much boost to the surrounding monsters. That being said, they need to kill those beasts first to control the monsters. Qi Ming then commands his beast pet, Red Flame Ape, to use Fire Fist Impact against its opponent. It was a tough exchange of blows and strikes, but it was not enough to kill the enemy beast. While the two beasts are ready to finish each other, Qi Ming commands Red Flame Ape to use its special move. Nonetheless, the enemy beast strikes Qi Ming's beast pet and almost gets beheaded in the process. Luckily, Red Flame Ape has an impressive reflex managing to dodge that deadly attack. Pissed off by its enemy, the Red Flame Ape uses its skill called Red Lotus Blast Boxing. Delivering consecutive powerful flaming punches, this is very effective as the punches blast off the flesh and organs of the enemy beast. Sheesh. Saitama trains this beast pet. While the Red Flame Ape continues to fight, Qi Ming receives a call that the military is already on the way and they will arrive in approximately 8 minutes. He then told his comrades to hold on a little longer, for the reinforcements were on their way. As they cheer for the announcement, one of Qi Ming's comrades instantly gets beheaded by an unknown attack. It looks like the enemy beast reinforcement has also arrived. The guys beside him can only stand in so much horror upon seeing his headless comrade, Mr. Zhang, when he looks from behind. A shadow of a female humanoid monster covers him. And before he can move another step, he instantly gets beheaded. Meanwhile, Bai Shouan fights the monsters with his water system. All of a sudden, he found himself being ganged up by three boosted monsters. Luckily, the monsters were pulled and stopped by a mysterious web. Then, he unleashes his strong water pressure from his body, knocking the remaining enemy beast in the process. After that, Bai Shuan is quite surprised to see that she is the one who helped him. He then asks her if the mutated candlelight spider has been promoted to bronze level. She then revealed to him that she bought some materials from the black market for her beast pet, and it leveled up. Thanks to her mythical talent, everything happens to her by luck. The Eye of the Apocalypse reveals that her beast pet comes from the race of the mutated candlelight spider with fire system from the primary bronze realm. It has lava body, A class, talent, and qualifies as advanced gold. Moreover, it has two signature skills, melting cut spider silk in blue grade and candle flame burning cluster in green grade. Hearing that, Bai Shouan cannot believe the amount of luck she has. Meanwhile, the boosted monsters start destroying the automatic machine guns of Ji Qing. Lao Duvin then admits that their firepower can no longer hold the herd of monsters, so he orders the beast masters to bring out their spiritual beasts. Hearing that, Ming Xiao commands his beast pet, Golden Horned Frog, to use its skill, Big Tongue. Then, all of a sudden, his beast pet unleashed its huge slimy tongue, pushing the enemies down the wall. Sheesh. The tongue is way bigger than his beast pet's body. Seeing everyone doing a great job, Bai Shouan feels very motivated to do great things too. That being said, he summons the mutated red-winged crow, which has evidently grown so much. Whoa, it is just me. Or its appearance truly resembles that of the Pidgeotto. This is the first time that Bai Shouan summons the mutated red-winged crow to fight. Then, just like that, his beast pet immediately showers the enemy with fire bullets, Despite the fact that Bai Shouan calls it back not to mess around, the mutated red-winged crow does things as it wants. The attacks are so effective and powerful that they pierce through your enemy's tough bodies. Pissed off, Bai Shouan lashes out as he has not given his command just yet. As expected from the mutated red-winged crow, it tells Bai Shouan that it is the embodiment of the sun. Why would it need his commands? Annoyed, Bai Shouan punches its head, giving it a head bump. Seeing him hit his own beast pet, Chavagubai, and her mutated candlelight spider, got extremely shocked. Well, these two have the friend-enemy type of bond. Meanwhile, on the other side of the lookout station, the area has no signs of beasts or humans. It turns out that they are hiding from a new monster that is way stronger than the previous ones. Shi Ming analyzes the monster and realizes that this humanoid monster is incredibly fast. He knows that he has no match for it at all. That being said, he figures out that the best thing for him to do is to hold on until reinforcement arrives. Out of nowhere, one of his allies loses his control and moves out of their hiding spot. This shocks Qi Ming, but is too late for him to stop his ally. 
He then moves out and showers the humanoid beast with bullets. And just like that, he instantly became beheaded. As the female humanoid monster stands still, her one hand holds the head of the guy. Now this is what you call big trouble, but can we all agree on how thick this monster is? The humanoid monster then senses its surroundings, and it throws the head of the guy he just killed. He Ming is holding his breath as he is just a few steps from his impending doom. He then receives a call informing him that the defense line to the east has been breached, and the herd of ferocious beasts is rushing toward the camp. This pisses him off as their misfortune that day never stops. That being said, he calls Feng Lang to do him a favor at 6 o'clock direction, to which Feng Lang immediately responds. As Feng Lang sight the beast with his scope, he tells their deputy squad commander that he owes him dinner that time and shoots the enemy with his sniper rifle. He then hits the head of the humanoid monster, and it flinches a little. At that moment, Qi Ming took the opportunity to attack it with its beast pet. The red flame ape uses his skill, Flame Blast, so it removes its eye patch and unleashes a strong beam of flame toward the humanoid beast. Well, I did not see that coming at all. The humanoid beast, however, easily dodges it. Then a huge explosion from the other side caught the attention of Bai Shouwen, Feng Lang, and Lao Duan. That being said, Bai Shouwen commands his beast pet to support the ones in need of help on the other side. Meanwhile, Qi Ming used his shield to protect himself and his beast pet from the rampaging humanoid monster. He then commands the red flame ape to go back to the royal beast space first. Not long after, the shield completely shattered, and the humanoid monster caught him. The monster then strangles his neck, ready to end his life. However, the mutated red-winged crow attacks the humanoid monster's arm, releasing Qi Ming in the process. Well, we should call it the save by the bird moment. Luckily, Lao Duan is there to catch Qi Ming. Lao Duan immediately asks his deputy squad leader if he is just okay. He then confirms that he is completely fine. However, Qi Ming also tells Lao Duan that if they cannot handle the humanoid beast, which is currently fighting against the mutated red-winged crow, they will surely going to die. That being said, Qi Ming is relieved that someone has to hold it down for them to get a chance. Feng Lang, on the other hand, decided to use the alchemical bullets made by Ji Qing to shut down the humanoid beast. He then calls his deputy squad leader to inform him that he owes him two meals, so he better not skip the bills again. As Feng Lang uses the alchemical bullet, its presence is very heavy. He then starts to worry that it might destroy his precious sniper rifle in the process. Then, just as he thought, it destroyed his sniper rifle with a single shot. The shot was so strong, and it blasted directly into the head of the humanoid monster. Fun Lang then calls his deputy squad leader to tell him that his sniper broke, and only the scope is left, so he has to compensate him. This guy's life is all about money and compensation. Quite annoying. Qi Ming then told him that he should call Ji Qing. For that is her field of expertise. He even commands him to find her. Meanwhile, Bai Shouwen, along with the mutated red-winged crow, Qi Ming, and Lao Duan, are waiting to see what happened to the humanoid beast. Lao Duan says that it is probably impossible for the humanoid monster to stand up after that strong blast. However, Qi Ming disagrees and asks them to look properly. Just as the dust and smoke subside, the thick humanoid monster is there standing still ready to deliver its next attack. Using his scope, Feng Lang looks at the unscathed humanoid monster. He then saw it punches the ground, and it suddenly went missing. To his surprise, the monster is already right in front of him, ready to end his life. Then just like that, a huge explosion happened from the lookout tower where he stays. Pai Shouwen stands in horror as he witnesses the humanoid beast's speed and agility as a gold level. When the humanoid monster comes out, he is holding the amputated mechanical arm of Feng Lang. I wonder if he survived that attack. From that location, the monster senses the spiritual power of the people below. That being said, the monster instantly appears behind Bai Shouan. Fortunately, he manages to activate the shield before it even touches him. Bai Shouan is in great fear and awe at the same time as the humanoid monster's speed is very difficult for the human eye to capture. The humanoid monster is very persistent in breaking the shield. That being said, Bai Shouan knows that the shield is about to collapse. Then just like that, the humanoid monster breaks through his barrier and is ready to behead Bai Shouan. All of a sudden, a sticky web pulls out Bai Shouan just right on time. And yes, it is none other than our spider girl, Chao Gubei. Well, Sis manages to save Bai Shouan's life with her spider silk better 
than how Spider-Man failed to save Gwen with his spider silk. Apparently, when Chao Bu Bai catches Bai Shaowen, his head lands on her soft and bouncy melons, which makes the two blush in awkwardness. Bai Shaowen then thanked her but said sorry at the same time. Chao Bu Bai, on the other hand, told him that he was welcome and that what happened was just okay. Chao Bu Bai did not waste any time and commanded her beast pet to use its skill called Lava Spray. Then, her beast pet shatters the ground and purple lava begins to come out. As the lava bursts on the location of the humanoid monster, it easily dodges them all. Noticing that the humanoid monster can easily dodge attacks, Ba Shawan realizes something. Even though its speed was fast enough, it could not dodge the gunfire attacks. On the contrary, it easily dodges all the spiritual power attacks from spirit beasts. In other words, it's highly likely that it can only sense fluctuations in spiritual power and not physical optical information. As soon as he figures it out, he informs the mercenary group that has thought of a way how to deal with the humanoid monster. Thus, he would neither help to do it. It looks like Bro figures out the enemy's weakness faster than how Sherlock Holmes unlocks mysteries. Meanwhile, Lo Duan and Chi Ming are seen running away from the battlefield. Bai Shouan then calls them out for their actions. Sheesh. Coward alert. With only two of them left, Bai Shouan tells Chao Gu Bai that they can only rely on each other from that moment and he asks her to wait for the perfect moment to escape. All of a sudden, Ming Xiao appears with his golden horned frog. He then tells the two not to forget that they have his silver level beast master on their side. Without further introduction, he uses his talent called Possessed to become one with the golden horned frog. That being said, the golden horned frog swallows his master alive. Seeing this, Bai Shawan and Chao Gu Bai get shocked and weirded out by what they are witnessing. They cannot believe their eyes with what just happened. However, the golden horned frog starts to glow and shrinks into a humanoid size. After completing the possession process, Ming Xiao projects the iconic Spider-Man pose. Not gonna lie, he looks extremely gross. Meanwhile, the Eye of Apocalypse revealed that Possess is an A-level talent that allows a contracted spirit pet to be possessed. It further explains that once the mind and the soul are transformed into a state of physical and mental unity, the various attributes will greatly improve the new skills that can be used. Chao Bai feels so disgusted with the appearance of the Ming Xiao. However, Bai Shouan thinks of this differently. While this ugly to Ming Xiao, his talent is a pretty useful skill to have. He prepares to attack the humanoid monster and starts releasing mucus all over its body. Feeling its enemy's spiritual power, the humanoid monster easily senses Ming Xiao and also prepares to attack. Ming Xiao uses Swamp Impact to instately reach the humanoid monster. However, as expected from the humanoid monster, it easily dodges Ming Xiao's advances. And just like that, Ming Xiao was torn into pieces along with his beast pet. Bro literally jumps to its death. His death was not in vain, though, as Bai Shouan confirms that he was indeed right. The humanoid monster can only detect targets with spiritual power, and it seems to rely on spiritual power for its judgment. Bai Shouan then tells Chao Gu Bai that their plan could be useful. On the other hand, Chao Gu Bai doubts if she herself and tells Bai Shouan that she is afraid she cannot do it. Bai Shouan then holds her hand, looks at her with so much sincerity, and tells her that there is no problem. He reiterates that he believes in her, and she has to believe herself. Hearing it, Chao Bu Bai starts blushing. Moreover, Bai Shouan tells her that she just did it earlier, so there is no reason for her not to be able to do it again. Soon after, the two, along with their beast pets, proceed with their plan. Bai Shouan moves to the specified location along with a mutated red-winged crow, while Chao Bu Bai is left behind along with a mutated cannibalite spider to do their separate plan. While walking, Bai Shouan assures her that he has 100% certainty that his plan will work. There you have it. Bro, it's always the unshakable confidence for me. He then approaches the humanoid monster that he calls Hammerhead Shark. Soon after, he releases his spiritual power to attract it. And as expected, she delivers a sneak attack from behind. Bai Shouan then removes, instantly removes his spiritual power, confusing the humanoid monster in the process. Pai Shouan also figures out that while it moves fast, it actually hesitates every time it attacks. He notices the repetitive pattern of the humanoid monster's actions, so he unleashes a very huge water system power, huge enough to confuse the enemy beast where to attack. Then he succeeded, for the beast indeed stopped attacking out of confusion. 
Bai Shouan knows that in the eyes of the humanoid monster, there's only a dazzling radiance like flames. That being said, he orders his beast pet, mutated red-winged crow, to attack the enemy. From that huge water system presence, the flaming charge of the mutated red-winged crow appears and directly hits the humanoid monster. The attack manages to push the humanoid monster to the specified location. In this area, it is noticeable that webs and spider silks are all over the place. Well, we can only assume that it was Xiao Gubai's work, right after pushing it. Bai Shouan commands the mutated red-winged crow to restrict its movement with the use of flame tornado. Just before the humanoid monster is able to come out from the open area of the flame tornado, Xiao Gubai asks the mutated candlelight spider to retract the web towards the flame tornado. Then, Bai Shouan commands the mutated red-winged crow to deliver its finishing blow, nuclear beam. Then just like that, a massive nuclear explosion happened in the lookout station. The explosion is very strong that was seen from a far distance, such as the Bolin City Border Checkpoint City Wall. That being said, the explosion is so strong that the whole lookup station got blown up. Bai Shouan and Chao Gubai appear again after they come out from the mythical royal beast space of Bai Shouan. So, that's how they survive the explosion. They basically hide from a different dimension. What a wise thinker you are, bro. Bai Shouan asks Chiao Gubai if she was all right, to which she immediately confirms. Just as they thought the fight was over, the humanoid monster's hand ascended from the ground. Chiao Gubai points it out and tells Bai Shouan that it is not dead yet. Bai Shouan could not believe his eyes that after all his efforts, the monster was still alive. Apparently, its body already disintegrates, and its bones and flesh are already exposed, yet it can still move. That being said, Bai Shouan summons his giant-scaled fish to devour it. When his beast pet successfully swallows the humanoid monster, a huge force, strong force comes out from the giant-scaled fish's mouth. This action, however, has a side effect as red electricity starts to appear all over the beast pet's body. Uh, oh, did bro endanger his own beast pet? Not long after, Bai Shouan also feels the exact same pain felt by the giant-scaled fish as red electricity appears from all over his body. That being said, Bai Shouan asks his beast pet to go back to the mythical royal beast space. Not long after, a secret tunnel underground opened, and it was none other than Lao Duan. He told everyone who hid in the underground tunnel that the battle should be done by that time. When they all come out, Qi Ming asks him to check the area to see if there's anyone who is still alive. The first thing Lao Duan saw was the chopped arm of Ming Xiao, who was killed by the humanoid monster. Imagine dying in a disgusting frog form and your body got chopped and got burned by a nuclear explosion. Bro has just suffered the most miserable death in Manwa history. Poor Ming Xiao. May you not be reincarnated as a frog in your second life. Lo Duan tells them that the surroundings have been obliterated completely. There should not be anyone alive. On the other hand, Qi Ming still asks him to look at the other part to confirm his speculations. Not long after, Qi Ming saw Bai Shouan and Chao Gubei. Bai Shouan's vision starts to turn black. He saw the remaining member of the Red Ape mercenary. Moreover, he heard Lao Duan telling everyone that the rich man Ming Xiao did not survive. As his vision starts to turn even darker, Qi Ming approaches Bai Shouan and calls Lao Duan to come over and help the young man. And just like that, Bai Shouan completely fainted. In his subconscious mind, Bai Shouan finds himself descending underwater. He then heard a voice calling his name. He starts wondering who is calling him, and the huge eye of the giant scale fish appears from below. His beast pet seems to suffer in great pain, and he completely wakes up drenched in sweat while catching his breath. What a bad nightmare to wake up from. I just hope that the giant scaled fish is completely fine. Chao Gubei Along with the red ape mercenary doctor, Sasha, checks up on him the moment he wakes up. Sasha told Chao Gubei that Bai Shouan should be fine. It turns out that he fainted because he used too much spiritual energy. Bai Shouan tells Sasha that it should not be happening to him. Then, he starts thinking about how did the upper limit of his spiritual energy became that low. Soon after, Lo Duan appears and informs him that their boss is looking for him. That night, Bai Shouan comes out of the tent with Lo Duan to talk to Qi Ming, who is currently sitting near the bonfire. Qi Ming acknowledges the fact that he is already awake and tells him honestly that he did not expect him to beat the humanoid monster and survive the huge explosion at all. Well, it looks like someone is impressed with Bro's capabilities. Bai Shouan, on the other hand, doesn't want to believe to what he says. 
especially after they ditched them and escaped by themselves. Lao Duan calls out for him, speaking rudely to their leader. Chi Megan, however, tells him that he can blame him as much as he wants, but as the vice leader of the Red Ape mercenary, he has the responsibility to bring his men out alive. Chi Ming further explains that if only he had known earlier that he was strong enough to explode the checkpoint, he would not do what he did. That being said, he went straight to the point and asked Bai Shawan if he would be interested in joining them. Bai Shawan then reiterated the fact he should not think he would easily believe his words and just join like that just because he wants him to join. Bai Shawan thinks that if Chi Ming can ditch them once, he can definitely ditch them again for the second time. That sounds like a trust issue to me, but I can't blame you, bro. Chi Ming tells Bai Shawan that they have lost some men and they are not as powerful as before. Therefore, they cannot ensure the success rate of their mission. Apparently, their mission is to escort their customer to Jialin Town. But judging from the situation they have at the moment, they are evidently short of manpower. Meanwhile, Bai Shawan starts thinking about Jialin Town, which is where they will go in order to reach Juma City. That being said, he thinks that it would be very convenient for them to follow them. Chi Meng also added that Bai Xiaowen should not refuse too quickly, but they will not let him join for nothing. He tells Bai Xiaowen to compensate them properly. Chi Meng offers to give him 30% of the money. Hearing the good proposition, Bai Xiaowen accepted the deal. However, Bai Xiaowen reiterated that he is not following him to work for him. Chi Meng happily closed the deal while telling Bai Xiaowen that he is quite a money lover. Well, Bai Xiaowen is already rich. If only Chi Meng knew, he wouldn't even dare to say it. Later that night, they reach the Jialin Town Red Ape Mercenary Team Outpost. It is like a resting area in the middle of the wilderness. The armed vehicles of the adventure group are parked inside the wooden gate. When Bai Xiaowan and Chao Gubai reach their destination, Lao Duan tells them that the journey is very tiring, for the motor keeps on breaking down and he has to repair it repeatedly. Oops, pros low-key complaining. Meanwhile, Bai Xiaowan starts to think that Chiyo Gubai's talent has taken effect. Lao Duan who is along with Qi Meng, tells the two that they will rest in that area for that night and continue to Jialin town later on. Bai Xiaowen then asks them why shouldn't they just enter the town directly. Qi Meng then explains to him that the banana forest is extremely dangerous at night. Even gold rankers may die inside it. Apparently, Jialin town is behind the banana forest. Not long after, an unknown rich woman starts complaining about why they have not reached Jialin town yet. Then, all of them look at who caused the commotion. It turns out that it was a loud, rich woman along with her loyal husband. Then, the man standing behind them is the young priest earlier, Sasha. On the other hand, tells her to shut up if she doesn't want to die, for she is attracting all the beasts in the forest.